I would now like to welcome Mr. Ron Peters, who is Vice President, Middle East and Emerging Markets with SINAC, to come on stage. Ron will be speaking on offensive and continuous security testing. The stage is yours. Hello. There you go. And with an echo. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Ron Peters uh, from CINIC. Um, it's great to pick up and be a speaker after Richard, um, given that he gave you a lot of insight and trends about what's the kind of attacks that happen, uh, how they happen, uh, how smart some of the sophistication and uh, the attackers become. Um, and what I would like to do is if we go to my, there we go, all right, got from that. So what I'd like to talk to you about is now how do we go and do that? We know that attacks happen all the time, they get more sophisticated, they're from all over the place. Um, so how can you weaponize yourself? Sure, you can use technologies, but then the attack already is happened and the breach potentially can happen. So is there a ways where you can really protect yourself well uh, in a preemptive, proactive way, so that when attacks happen, they're not successful? So what I'd like to do is uh, take you for a little journey uh, this morning. Uh, talking about um, a new way of doing this and also talk about the ways that today uh, you're trying to protect yourself well are increasingly become obsolete and, and ineffective in protecting you. And that's worrisome because what you're doing means it's just not good enough to really protect you very well. Um, he, uh, Richard spoke about a lot of these trends and, and different kind of threats, so I don't have to speak too much about it. Uh, but what he didn't speak too much about is the, 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 the people who are doing this. Uh, what are they and why are they motivated? And what we see is we see a kind of a difference in, in trends of how this is emerging. So before we had a lot of um, malicious actors trying to break environments, uh, doing electronic surveillance, try to see who has open ports, who we have a particular security patch is not applied and try to leverage that. Um, that has changed a little bit. So on one side, we see the commercial motivated those that try to break in, ransomware you, try to steal data, go to the darknet and sell it. On the other hand, you see the nation state sponsored groups, uh, which is quite a, in a geopolitical play that you have in the Middle East that's, uh, that's uh, have become very um, uh, successful. Um, and what they're doing is they're actually since last year and early this year, I heard from all my customers in the Middle East, they have, uh, the attacks have become very targeted. And it makes my customers and probably you very nervous because if you have a burglar that's trying to break into your house and is not successful, okay, then maybe you're right. But when you see that burglar come back every week or every month, they know sooner or later they're likely going to be successful. And that really makes you not sleep very well. And that is what's happening right now. So I see a lot of this kind of stuff happening. Um, and and, and yeah, sooner or later, you could be out of luck. Um, so then the question is, well, how do I weaponize myself against that? And because you have a big landscape, you have multiple layers of protection, you use different technologies, different services, different tools, you use a lot of different things, an entire ecosystem to protect your organization. And on the other hand, those that attack you, they only have to get lucky once. Only once they have to get lucky. And then they're inside your network. So I have some of the banks here that are my clients, and probably more coming shortly in the next one or two months. Um, and what they worry about is that there is somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, spinning up a box inside the bank network, and get exposed to the outside, and that's the one who will take down your bank and make you lose a lot of money or get in a very embarrassed and disruptive situation. So then the question is, how can I deal with that? Because it's not fair, it's not a fair game, right? You have to protect the entire perimeter. And those on the other side, they can take six, nine months time with a kill chain right behind it to, to break in and just have to get lucky once. We do, therefore, what you want to do is you want to proactively test an environment. So the, the sum of everything I deployed, all the tools, practices, technology to deploy, is it really working or do I still have some cracks in the wall? It's like putting a house together. You know, you put the house together and said, do the windows open? Do the doors close? Or is there still somewhere a draft coming in from my house? And you see, the more proactively you do that, the more innocent it is, and it doesn't mean very much in a normal course of business. You don't do it, you do it too late, it's dramatic. 
and might cost your job anyway. Because if you're the person responsible for security, guess who's going to be responsible for all of this? And there's two ways that one typically does that. The first way is say, well, let's use technology. Technology is scalable. It's easy. You buy it. It runs 24 hours a day. It doesn't need lunch breaks and so on. So you get into automated tools, right? So we run scanners. We use these type of, of things. And even some that say, well, I can do automated, automated penetration testing. Uh, what we are finding is that currently 93% of serious exploits, I'm not talking about all, I'm not talking about low end, I'm talking about serious exploits, are not found with any kind of automated technology, including our own, doesn't matter. You know, it's not good enough. For example, you're trying to do, um, you're trying to find a bypass on a two-way authentication on a web application. There's no technology that can figure this out and be creative enough to figure out how, how that would work and how you can look for those type of things. And then besides that, it's very noisy, it's automated, there's no remediation advice, there's really nothing with it, so it causes a lot of headache for the organization dealing with the noise. So that puts us back to actually what we have been doing for a long time, which is traditional compliance-based penetration testing. Right? One, two, three, five consultants or a number of people in your security department uh, will go and test these things all day long. A couple of problems with it. The first problem is the, your competition has changed. The competition is world-class sophisticated. The nation state sponsored groups, including the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world that are well known for this, are very successful, very sophisticated. And those that do it for commercial purposes are very well funded. They make hundreds of millions a year. That's your competition. That's a rough play, right, to fight up against that. So because on the other side, you always have limited budgets. So the procurement department gets involved and said, well, we're going to go low cost, minimum hours, minimum skills, minimum everything. You think, I got to go get the best researchers, the best ones around the world, the many or large number of hours, and so on. And so does your management, and so does your shareholders, and so does think your customers. And so thinks Qatar as a country. So you have an instant conflict in that environment of what you really should be doing and what you're doing. And then the end sum of this whole is that what you actually get is not what you want. What you get is a compliance-based security test that says, here are my, my, the items, check, 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 check. OK, it's good. Like PCI testing, once a year, good to go. All right, we're off the hook for a year. That's not what you want. What you want is top researchers can figure out what do attackers do and try to mimic the behavior. You expect an adversarial perspective. So the next thing what happens, you have a penetration test done and your company gets breached. And you're wondering what happened. Well, that's what happened, right? And this is what you get. This is an example, live example, of a Middle Eastern company, well known, probably traded, right here in Middle East. They were tested by one of the major IT firms that are well known for doing this kind of work. And they're very good at it. But this is what happened. They gave these, this client their most important application that they run on as a, as a company. They gave them a clean bill of health. They said, can't find anything significant. You know, this is so hard. Yeah, nobody can get through this. Doesn't matter, right? My company went to work. This is our result. Within 24 hours, not a week or a month, 24 hours, this is what we found. The red ones are high in criticals when the vulnerability is up to CVS as of 10. It's embarrassing, right? But it's not embarrassing because what they got is not what they wanted or what they needed. They wanted to protect the parameter. They wanted to say, what, what do my attackers do? What do these nation state sponsor hacking groups do? I want that mimicked in a, in a way so that I can preempt that. What they got is a compliance-based penetration test with the procurement, uh, procurement department procuring it. That's what they got. So what the vendor did was absolutely fine, well-known firm, one of the big fours in the world, right? But not what the customer wanted, and therefore, they were easily breachable. And easily is within less than a day time. That's easy, right? For people who know what they're doing, top people. I'm not talking about the script kits or what people are trying to do, but top researchers. And that's the difference between what we're doing today and what one should be doing tomorrow. This is not what you want your organization to be. You think you can sleep all right, but you cannot sleep fine at all. You have live breach points sitting in your live environment. Many, not one, many. So this is how then my company, I'll tell you a little bit about, but not so much because I want this really to be educational. 
So the way we come at it, we don't come out of IT like all the other organizations here. We come out of offensive intelligence. So my organization, or the founders of it, worked for the National Security Agency, U.S. Department of Defense, breaking into terrorist networks, breaking into hostile government environments, seeing themselves inside, loading up malware, doing all these type of things, and also working with Qatar, a uh, uh, country and, and organizations here, to, um, for a lot of bad things from, from happening. Right? And they found it was so easy with their, their military-grade approach and the offensive approach to break into anything anywhere in the world with a piece of cake that they said, well, we'll leave and we'll, I think the rest of the world needs this help, kind of help too. So it's a pure offensive adversarial approach and we're probably now one of the most attack, elite uh, tech organizations in the world because we have about 1,500 of these kind of researchers that do one thing, adversary testing, offensive testing, mimicking attack behavior, mimicking a different kind of TTPs. The way the Russians or the Chinese attack or other, some other friendly neighbors, they have all different TTPs. Unless you know those, you cannot be effective in doing the job that you're asked to do, or what at least what the customer expects. And within the framework, you know, in my case, uh, there's a lot of interesting things happen. Didn't want to bug you with it. But for example, Microsoft is a lead investor in my company, and so is Google. So if the technology companies understand the limitations of one does today, and think what we're kind of doing here in this offensive adversarial space is a good idea. It's not only a good idea, they're actually investors in that kind of environment, and we work closely together with them. Actually, right now, we are, over the weekend, I had to work in Southeast Europe. There's a major government was breached. Uh, really a bad situation. Uh, Microsoft brought in, in Cynic, and in two days' time, we actually have to, uh, to load up and, uh, and do a lot of testing and test all the external phasing assets of the entire government that fast. And that's in a new model, the new way you want to work and how we work. There's no more long one or two month lead time for, uh, oh, can I plan a test for uh, November, December? No, it's now. The World Cup is coming up. Soon my systems need to freeze. I need to hurry up, right? I live in a DevOps SDLC world. You know, I cannot wait uh, for longer periods of time. So not to bug you with it, but then basically what you do is the competition you have to look at is those that attack you. It's not about getting me research and cost $400 a day. It's like, no, who's better or as good as those that will attack me? That is my benchmark. And I actually, I only want my own people or those that I hire in to be at a level or higher up than that. So we're now talking a world-class competition, to use the, the soccer team, right? World-class. It's the best of the best from around the world. I recently had for a client, one of the biggest telecoms here in, in the Middle East, a Log4j project was ordered Friday, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, we found a Log4j, one of the top guys in the world. That's the competition. Those are the, the type of environments that can help you get that extra mile in. And how you then do that in a new world is virtually the best researchers in the world are not here in Qatar, or maybe a few, but most of them are not here, and are not necessarily available, right? And at least not for the next month, two months. So now what do you do? We are in a new world, we're in a virtual world. We learned to work in a virtual world when Corona hit, right? We thought we couldn't do that. Everybody needs to come to an office. It's not true. We live now in a virtual world, but thereby you also have an opportunity to put a new technology, new ways by which you control and create transparency that you never had before. When you have a consultant come to your office and say, well, I'm more comfortable because I see the person face to face, during lunchtime, you don't know what they're doing on the laptop. Actually, you don't even know what they're testing. You do not know. It doesn't exist. So the business we're in is a crazy business when you think about it. We do accounting without journaling, right? In accounting world, I give you profit and loss statement, and I give you the journals. I said, this is how the numbers flow up into your, into your, in your balance sheet, your income statement. In the business we're in, I said, trust me, here is your profit and loss statement. And you ask, how did you get to it? I said, I don't know. What do you mean? I said, well, trust me, I'm you know, a good accounting firm. It's crazy. You bet your company, your job, everything you bet on that. You should have a right to do it, so you can see how obsolete it kind of is, the old-fashioned way we work. So the new world, we work in full package capture. We can replay everything, what a researcher does, where they're going, what they're testing, how they're even testing, how much remote code execution, how much SQL injection, how much cross-site scripting. And we are addressing things that we know for a long time. If you look at web applications, right, the number one vulnerability type we're finding nowadays in web application is cross-site scripting. It's 
been around a long time, right? Many years. And we still, that's number one, one type we find today. That means we've got a way to go. It's not good enough what we're doing. That should be all long gone, right? So you have to work in a new way. And a new way means you use different kind of tools and methodologies that are virtually. And I can deploy today, if need be, I can deploy best research from around the world in your organization, on your target, on your government department, whatever it is. We can do that today. I cannot get you the best researchers to fly into Qatar in the next month. It doesn't work, it's an old-fashioned model. So then what we also do is take it one, a couple steps further and say, great, so we have the understanding now, we're doing traditional compliance-based testing, doing a traditional way, so we can take more an offensive approach. But then it doesn't stop, right? Because everything stops there, but that's where it starts. That's not where it stops, where it, where it starts is you get a report that says, you have five vulnerabilities with a CVS as of 10. And you're like, now, now panic starts to hit, right? Because you need to go and fix these things. By the time that happens, those that found the vulnerabilities went on because they're busy for the next two months. And you're like stuck. You have questions, your development department needs to be involved. You know, there's a lot of things that needs to be done. You need advice, you need things retested. So you're on your own, good luck. Old fashioned model, that's not the model, the model should work. The model should work today is that whoever found, helped find these vulnerability environment are staying along throughout the entire remediation process. And I can give you a statistic that 60% of the vulnerabilities that have been fixed that are serious on the first try do not pass a retest. So they go back and test, you know, go back and fix the fixed process. So you can see it's more of a, of a, of a flow than just saying, okay, here's your report, pay me my bill, I'm off, You're, good luck. And then the, the last thing in that, here you see some examples, right? Now the world also changes, and let's see if I can get this, I don't know, oh, I have to go back. Uh, what you see here, this is an example, it's a live customer here in the Middle East. Uh, this is, by the way, an ISV application. We've been talking this year, uh, last year, about supply chain risk, right? So we test what you have, but you don't test what you have from others. Oops, right? So maybe you should consider doing some of these things. This is a, a third-party application. Should be safe, right? It was tested by one of the other uh, major um, top four IT vendors uh, in the world. Uh, Clean Build Health, a bank, third-party banking application. This is our result. I give you a couple highlights. Right top side, nine man weeks of testing performed in one week time. 10 vulnerabilities found, six are high. Three, I could still customer data. One I, could, I can get is reach into the SWIFT module and pay myself 10 million or whatever I want it to be. Clean bill of health, major four, top four IT providers, right? They paid money for it, the in-house provider. Not good enough. Even worse, if you look here, you can't read this very well, but this is day one. In day one, we found, I think, eight out of the 10 vulnerabilities. Day one. This is about even try, well, we try very hard, but it's that fast, right? So it shows you again and again, what we do today is not good enough. We need to harden our attack servers. We need to opt our game. Those that attack us do it too, by the way. And then the last thing, tell us that we have in that, is that we've become now a dynamic world. We're agile, right? We update our content applications regularly, every month, whatever. It's no longer we have a web and mobile application infrastructure that changes, but the whole year it stays the same, static. Not true, it doesn't work that way. So how do you deal with it from a security perspective? So you need to the world of what we call continuous testing. And I start seeing some of the regulatory authorities here in the media to start to say, continuous testing and not meaning continuous scanning, continuous testing, because they realize that things change like every month. And I have some clients here, um, some of the banks are clients here in, uh, in Qatar. One of the things they struggle with is that developers come up with new fixes, updates, content, and say, hey, can you fix that? Uh, can you test it this week so it can go live by the weekend? They're like, do I look like a magician? You know, where, where, where I find these security researchers that, that are sitting around doing nothing, waiting for you to give them work to do? They're not available for a long time. So you have to think about how you work that way. And here you see a good example of that. And I have another example after this. 
This is another, uh, this actually is, um, yeah, also made a Middle Eastern uh, uh, company. Um, we do there in that particular case continuous testing. I can see that because I see 1,200 hours on the right top side. Here again, you see in the beginning a lot of these vulnerabilities I found. So did a good job, right? I found a bunch of things nobody knew about, and this is only medium high critical. Well, this is not low. Then it goes flat, and all the ones it doubles again. So what happened there? In a continuous testing environment, you do also manual testing on an ongoing basis. I swapped out the testing team. I put a whole new team in. And I do that every 45 days. And then you see that this speaks towards something which is say, don't do things once, do it in an iterative way, do it more regular. And this is reflected uh, in, in different ways. I will spin over this. This is about documentation, so on. It's a bit boring for you. Um, so and what, what are then the most common times that we see? So we see a lot around web. Well, web has become very much in a DevOps as DLC world. It's difficult to deal with it from a security perspective. Right? It's a moving target. A um, lot of mobile, actually mobile, we see most of the vulnerabilities actually not in the application itself, but we see it in the API. Um, and then uh, we do also, of course, a lot of APIs and a lot of infrastructure. Infrastructure. All my, my infrastructure projects in, in Middle East are extremely successful. And extremely successful, successful means that we find many serious exploits uh, in the infrastructure. Too many, actually. And that tells me that the security posture is not as strong as it needs to be. Right? So that's more of, a, I think, a general perspective. And you see different kind of like testing, black box, gray box, and so on. Typically, black box is done on the entire attack service. And a gray box testing is typically done on the most mission critical applications. So you're an airline, it's the application where you book your, uh, book your uh, flights in a bank, it's your internet banking, corporate banking, trading, uh, those type of things. Now, I give you one, I give you um, a couple, um, two, I think, interesting examples because these are recent examples. Uh, the first one is uh, um, uh, one, uh, uh, well, actually, it's, it's a, bit, a bit ago, but it's uh, very, very active. There was an example of a test being done. We did like 26, that's about 26 man weeks of testing in one week time. So I live in a different world. In my world, that means that in this particular case, I give you basically in concept 26 of some of the best researchers in the world, and I will put them on your project for an entire week. 26, not one, two, or five, 26. This is 26 people, right? 26 top researchers. Now you also have to think about my kind of clients. My clients are the US Department of Defense, the fourth large banks in the UK, HSBC, Banco Santander, Lloyds, uh, Coxa Bank. Um, you know, I have uh, telecoms in the Middle East, I have governments, I'm, I'm talking here to ministries, we have civil banks here as clients. Everybody's trying to weapon, uh, weapon themselves more and harden their environment. Now, if you look at this particular case, this is interesting because what you also see here is that in one week time, I found 29 vulnerabilities, medium high critical. Telecom, right? Telecom, this is the site where you order your mobile phone, where you buy your data bundle and pay for it, where you have your phone records so you can see who I'm calling. That one, that's this one. Telecom, Middle East, right? This is the result. Number of critical CPSS of 10, full control takeover. Holy macaroni, right? Life. Give you one more. This actually is a, a bank. This is a major bank in the Middle East. Not in Qatar, but in the Middle East. This one, um, I don't know if you all can read it. That's a continuous test. We did, we did 1,400 hours in eight months' time. So that's about 21, 2,200 hours in a year, right? That's more than one man year, right? On only this application. Um, in a bank, 49 vulnerabilities, 41 vulnerabilities, 41 in a bank. Only this application, 41. Um, CVSS is that. Now, in this environment, I don't know if it says it somewhere, we found one vulnerability critical, one vulnerability high, 39 medium. Breaking a banking application, that's probably the hardest attack service there is, besides the Defense Department. 41 vulnerabilities in eight months' time. Nothing wrong with the bank, it's just that it's not hard enough, because if we can do it, potentially somebody else can do it too, right? And this is my last example. This is an airline, this is an airline that flies into Doha. Doha. I've flown it, I've flown it not a long ago. I had to think a bit for a second about booking my flight on their website. Um, 
what we did there, we didn't do very much. We did 400 hours of testing, one week time. So that basically means I give you 10 top researchers from around the world for one week. 10 only on this thing, 10 for an entire week. 54 on vulnerabilities, whoops. All right, red ones, CVSS of 10. 10 vulnerabilities of a CVSS of 10 where uniquely I can take over this entire website of this airline. It's bizarre. And it didn't take me too much. It took me one week, 400 hours of testing, and I got in there, right? So nothing wrong with the airline. It's just not good enough. Because if we can do it, somebody bad can do it too. So the bottom line is what you need to do is you need to figure out a way to opt your game. And your game to opt is to find the best researchers around the world, and many of them, right, to do offensive testing. Offensive testing. I'm here whole week. I'm talking to ministries. I'm talking to banks. I'm talking to telecom. I'm talking, I don't know. I, I, I have to look at my calendar who I'm talking to because I talk to so many people. And they see this, and they say, the World Cup is coming in. I, I don't want this picture. I want to harden my environment before it gets that far. And actually, the World Cup has nothing to do with it, because one of the, the CISOs from one of the banks here I was talking to he said, it has nothing to do with the World Cup. We just, as a better practice, we need to protect ourselves better. After the World Cup, the attacks will continue. So then, I think this is the last one, so and then I'll just stop on this. Um, so basically, there's then two ways of doing it, right? Things point in time, we do it once a year, twice a year, three year, times a year, or do it continuous. And continuous is all my clients, all of them are all either at or going to continuous testing. It's the new way. Continuous offensive testing is the way to go. It's the new future, the new emerging standard. And you will see that, in, uh, that the value add, I've seen with the examples, you have seen what that impact can have on your organization. So I'll be delighted to, to share this here with you. I'm around. Uh, I have a partner here at Paramount. Um, but anyway, I, I hope you, you at least get a bit of insight from here that you typically are not as safe as you think you are unless you take the more new emerging, um, more higher sophistication methods of trying to assess uh, your own external parameter and your assets and trying to harden those. And please do, do, do so because sooner or later, you know, you, you kind of run out of luck and better not be for the World Cup. So um, I hope this is very helpful, and thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Thank you.